It's been a treat for me to uh, hear from people interested in realism and religion, and the intersection of the two. And I also uh, would say I, I'm in the great position of having been, felt like I got the benefits both as a student and as an instructor in this series. I, I've learned a lot. Um, so as was mentioned, my talk today is part of a larger uh, book project uh, that is tentatively titled Political Realism in Apocalyptic Times. And it does look at how three canonical political realists, Machiavelli, Hobbes, and Morgenthau, respond to hopes and fears about the end of the world in their respective times. And what I want to do today is give you a taste of how this argument plays out in the case of Hans Morgenthau's treatment of the prospect of nuclear annihilation. Um, so let's start with a sort of conventional portrait of Morgenthau. Uh, Morgenthau is often seen, and indeed he self-identifies as a paradigmatic political realist. And by that I mean he's often taken as regarding conflict and power, as constitutive of politics, as rejecting, as utopian, those approaches which seem to deny this fact, and of prioritizing the requirements of political order and stability over the demands of justice. And like realists in international relations, more specifically, he's also often interpreted, if not entirely correctly, as holding the view that states are the primary units and actors in international politics. Now, there is certainly ample support for this interpretation of Morgenthau in his book Politics Among Nations, his hugely influential uh, textbook on international politics, and particularly in the six principles of political realism included at the uh, outset of the work from the second edition onward. And those principles include, for instance, that mainstay of realist thought the assumption that, quote, statesmen think and act in terms of the national interest defined as power. And that's an idea that Morgenthau develops in uh, further and what is considered another classical realist work on American foreign policy in defense of the national interest. And now together, these books help to secure Morgenthau's status as a founding father of the field of international relations in the United States um, and his work was, uh, was, as I said, immensely influential, at least through the end of the 1960s and for a lot of people um, through to the 1970s as well. Yet we rarely stop to put Morgenthau's thought in its context. And at least part of that context, I want to suggest today, is an apocalyptic one. Morgenthau, a German Jewish emigre who left Germany in 1932 and came to the United States in 1937, wrote his most influential works in the shadow of the Holocaust and the looming threat of nuclear annihilation. And the ways in which both the Holocaust and the threat of nuclear annihilation were conceived in his time drew on what I call an apocalyptic imaginary. And what I mean by that is uh, it's a set of narratives, images, and understandings about the end of the world that have their roots in biblical sources, but that recur in the contemporary era in locations far from their theological origins, often in purportedly secular interpretations of the end of the world. And central to all manifestations of the apocalyptic imaginary is an expectation of the imminent end, and often the violent end, of the known world and the arrival of a radically new future. Happy to say a bit more about this idea of the imaginary in the, in the Q&A, but I think what I mean by it should become clear over the, the course of the, the talk. Now, the case I want to make to you today is that understanding this apocalyptic context helps us to come to grips with a tremendous and very interesting shift in Morgenthau's work in the early 1960s. His early work in international relations, his work from the 1940s to the 19, early 1960s, is characterized, I would suggest, by a tragic worldview whose insistence on the inescapable 
an undecided struggle of politics is perhaps an understandable response to what he takes to be America's crusading liberalism, but it leaves Morgenthau ill-equipped to confront the novelty of the nuclear threat. However, in the early 1960s, in the shadow of the terrifying prospect of thermonuclear war, Morgenthau turns away from tragedy and adopts an apocalyptic worldview. Against dangerously optimistic scenarios of nuclear war, he offers a terrifying account of an apocalypse without worldly redemption. Faced with the novel threat of nuclear annihilation, he seems to conclude that tragedy is not enough. We must imagine the apocalypse in order to prevent it. And this, I think, gives us a different Morgenthau than the one commonly portrayed in international relations. This is a Morgenthau willing to engage not only with questions of interest or the distribution of power, but with the imagination, um, with the ways in which people imagine their world and the effect that has on uh, foreign policy and international politics. Now the talk today, the lecture, proceeds in three parts. I want to start by giving you a sense of what I call the post-war apocalyptic imaginary the ways in which the narratives, images, and common understandings in America of the Holocaust and the prospect of nuclear annihilation were understood in apocalyptic terms. Second, I want to explore the difficulties that Morgenthau had in coming to grips with the novelty of the nuclear threat. And I attribute these difficulties, at least in part, to the tragic worldview that pervades his work from the 1940s and 1950s. And finally, I'll outline what I take to be a decisive turn that Morgenthau takes away from that earlier worldview in the early 1960s, drawing on resources from within the post-war apocalyptic imaginary. He calls upon us to imagine the apocalypse in order to prevent it. <coughs> now, for survivors of the Nazi genocide, as well as for others seeking to come to grips with the moral, theological, and human enormity of these events, the language and imagery of apocalypse provided a natural, imaginative touchstone. And I take Elie Wiesel's thoughtful but troubling essay, A Vision of the Apocalypse, as illustrative of this kind of interpretation. For Wiesel, the apocalypse was not a prophesied future but a lived reality. And so he explains, to the extent that my contemporaries believe in the apocalypse, they refer to the one they lived through. They speak of memory more than vision. And so for him, the calm slaughter of thousands of Jews in a single day, doctors separating potential experimental subjects from those destined for the gas chambers, and lawyers crafting the final solution at the Wansi Conference mark a fundamental shift in the apocalyptic imaginary away from its theological origins in Daniel and Revelation. The apocalypse for Wiesel is no longer great beasts spewing forth flames or horsemen ushering in destruction or homes ransacked and collapsing in an earthquake imparting to history a hallucinatory fiery end. Rather, it is a spacious and well-lighted office, well-bred technocrats, efficient secretaries, it is government employees working together with or without passion, with or without conviction, first to imagine, then to bring about Auschwitz. This is an apocalypse devoid of divine or satanic agency. It is carried out by calm, cultured professionals who had all read Goethe and admired Schiller. Yet this account of the experience at Auschwitz shares more with older religious apocalypses than Wiesel admits. Both are ruptures in the temporal continuity of history. For Wiesel, even as Auschwitz negates history, it represents, and I'm quoting him again, a kind of aberration and culmination of history. Everything brings us back to it. Illuminated by its flames, the present appears more understandable. 
It is the culmination of a history of anti-Semitism, persecutions, expulsion, and violence. It offers a terrifying revelation of truths about Western culture that had been hidden or only half visible for centuries. And finally, for Wiesel, the Holocaust ushers in a fundamentally new world, but not one of redemption and salvation. Instead, it is a new world that bears symptoms and traces of terrifying and irrevocable events. Wiesel ends his essay by considering whether the apocalypse of Auschwitz could be transposed into the future. He does not fear a return to ghettos and gas chambers, but rather the possibility that the culture of indifference and apathy that he thinks permitted the Holocaust would now fail to prevent a nuclear apocalypse. So for Wiesel and others, the Holocaust is linked imaginatively to the prospect of nuclear annihilation. For us, he explains, time stopped between Auschwitz and Hiroshima. This connection is by no means particular to Wiesel. For many, the images and lived experiences of Nazi genocide became a way to imagine the possibility of nuclear annihilation. In a 1962 piece in the Atlantic Monthly, poet and critic A. Alvarez hypothesized that our fear of nuclear annihilation was one of the reasons the concentration camps had captured the popular imagination. There are no limits to the inflationary spiral of destruction. From 1940 to 1945, nearly 4,500,000 people died in Auschwitz. The same number would die in minutes if a hydrogen bomb landed on London. The gap is very small between the comforts of our affluent society and the bare animal squalor of Birkenau, or the finality of the Auschwitz crematorium with its rasping iron trolleys. So perhaps the concentration camps have kept a tight hold on our imaginations because we see in them, we see them as a small-scale trial run for nuclear war. Alvarez's shift from comparative calculations to the images of Auschwitz is important here, from the abstract, unthinkable, enormous numbers to the animal squalor, the crematorium, and the rasping iron trolleys. The analogy between the concentration camp and the effects of nuclear destruction is not merely or even primarily one based on comparative death tolls, but on a shared visual vocabulary of annihilation. And more than 20 years later, the nuclear physicist I.I. I. Rabi would rely exclusively on imagistic association. And I'm quoting him. And now we have the nations lined up, like those prisoners at Auschwitz, going into the ovens and waiting for the ovens to be perfected and made more efficient. And this imaginative connection between nuclear annihilation and the experience in the concentration camps runs through a lot of post-war American thought about nuclear holocaust. So it's with these images of extermination, in addition to the haunting reports from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that post-war America imagined nuclear annihilation. Now, Despite the fact that the nuclear apocalypse would be wrought by human rather than divine agency, the theological images and narratives of the biblical apocalypse were rarely far from the surface in an attempt to come to grips with the radical novelty of nuclear weapons. As, as a sort of aside, I should note that I think scholars of the history of apocalypticism often make too much of the contrast between a divine apocalypse that promises spiritual renewal, and a human and technological apocalypse that brings total annihilation. I think the contrast forces the same false choice that Leonard Cohen offers in his darkly apocalyptic song, The Future, when he says, give me Christ or give me Hiroshima. My sense is that the American post-war apocalyptic imaginary often blended a fear of total annihilation with a hope for worldly and spiritual renewal giving us both Christ and Hiroshima. So for example, it's with profoundly redemptive hopes that J. Robert Oppenheimer, the scientific director of the Manhattan Project, chose the codename Trinity for the first full-scale test of the atomic bomb. 
He confessed years later that he had been reading the 17th century English poet John Donne. And Oppenheimer cited two poems that were his inspiration for the, the code name. But in both of which, Dunn stresses the theological connection between destruction and renewal. And so I give you a passage from one. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand. Overthrow me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make new. So Dunn in this poem is begging God to batter, to bend, to break, to burn him in order that he may be made new. This connection between destruction and redemption may have been especially meaningful for Oppenheimer, who sustained himself during the Manhattan Project with the hope that nuclear weapons could be used to overpower evil and usher in a new world without war. Of course, more famously, upon witnessing the Trinity test on July 16, 1945, Oppenheimer would reach for a much darker and non-Western theological vision. He recalled the lines from the Bhagavad Gita, if the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once into the sky, that might be like the splendor of the mighty one. I am become death, the shatterer of worlds. Now, upon learning of the results of the July 1945 Trinity test of the atomic bomb, President Truman would reach for similarly dark, though distinctly Christian, biblical imagery. We have discovered the most terrible bomb in the history of the world. It may be the fire destruction prophesied in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. Winston Churchill's reaction a few days later was even darker. The atomic bomb is the second coming in wrath. But the 1950s development of the hydrogen bomb, a phenomenal new weapon with over 700 times the power of the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the American government itself toyed with a secularized variant of the apocalyptic link between destruction and renewal. American policymakers had begun to worry that public knowledge, the devastating effects of nuclear war, might make Americans less willing to support national policies that might involve the risk of nuclear warfare. In 1956, the National Security Council ordered a classified study of the effects of the threat of nuclear annihilation on American attitudes and behavior. A panel of social scientists completed a report entitled The Human Effects of Nuclear Weapons Development. And the report recommended a widespread program of town hall meetings aimed at balancing public awareness of the effects of nuclear weapons with, quote, an increased knowledge and understanding of both the broad aspects of national security and the specific countermeasures that can reduce the effects of nuclear attack. The report concluded by noting that nuclear war could provide survivors with an opportunity for heroism and renewal. The extremity of human disaster might become the opportunity for resolute survivors. It is a brave thing, admittedly, to brace ourselves against the threat of annihilation. It is another and better thing to nerve ourselves to make the very best of the very worst. At this historic crossroads, we would begin with knowledge and we would end with wisdom. Thus, to take counsel with one another to the very town meeting grassroots would be to draw inspiration from our forefathers and to point our children to the sources which make all American generations one and which raise hope for a new dynamics of the human race. It is a vision indeed, but where visions flourish, nations endure. Now, the Human Effects Report was perhaps, thankfully, eventually shelved, um, but it suggests a, a strong concern with tempering fears of nuclear annihilation with a patriotic and apocalyptic optimism that treats destruction as the prerequisite for renewal. Now, others also saw reasons for optimism in a post-apocalyptic future. These optimists turned to the predictions of thinkers like Herman Kahn, a systems theorist at the Rand Corporation, who argued that despite the hostility of a post-nuclear war environment, 
survivors might still enjoy, quote, relatively normal and happy lives. He even predicted that within a few years, the standard of living, quote, would be higher than the standards prevalent in the US between 1900 and 1930. These kinds of optimistic predictions, combined with President Kennedy's 1961 Civil Defense and Fallout Shelter Initiative, helped fuel radical hopes. In an October 1961 editorial, Life magazine argued that a shelter building campaign, quote, will give all Americans the hope that they, like their forebears, can someday abandon the stockades to cross whatever new mountains of adversity or trial might lie ahead. Later that month, an article in Time magazine struck a similar note. Quote, only two days after the thermonuclear attack, many adults might start emerging from the protection of their shelters for brief periods. With trousers tucked into sock tops and sleeves tied around wrists, with hats, mufflers, gloves, and boots, the shelter dweller could venture forth to start ensuring his today and building for his tomorrow. End quote. But the human effects report and these more popular images attempt to elicit is not just the hope that Americans could survive a nuclear attack. Rather, they go beyond nuclear optimists like Khan and present an enticing image of a clean slate, an apocalyptic opportunity to create the world anew, to engender, as the human effects report says, uh, a new dynamics of the human race. This, I think, is the vision of renewal through apocalyptic destruction that is often missing from the standard accounts of nuclear fear in Cold War America. It is this more ambiguous and at times optimistic vision that will provide an important contextual backdrop for Morgenthau's attempt to wrestle with the dangers of this post-war apocalyptic imaginary. However, Morgenthau's response takes shape over several decades. Initially, he had great difficulty coming to grips with the novelty of the nuclear threat. During the 1940s and 1950s, his position develops and changes with advances in nuclear capabilities. In 1948, he casts nuclear weapons as merely the latest stage in the mechanization of warfare. Nuclear weapons represent a development that is similar in kind, though far greater in magnitude to the invention of the machine gun. Nevertheless, it is a development that, along with the crusading political ideologies of the 20th century, has made total war possible. As he outlines in Politics Among Nations, the obvious solution to this problem is a world state that can extract loyalty from humanity as a whole, provide the citizens of the world with some measure of justice, and establish a monopoly of organized violence. The mistake of previous advocates of international government, he suggests, had been to assume that such an institution could be imposed from above. Just as the national state emerges from bottom-up demands of society for Morgenthau, a world state would first require a world society. Unfortunately for Morgenthau, there's no escaping the fact that most people still invest their highest loyalties in the nation state. Occasional bursts of humanitarian assistance aside, there's little evidence for him, at least in 48, of the kind of supranational society required to create a world state. And so Morgenthau concludes, there is no shirking the conclusion that international peace cannot be permanent without a world state, and that a world state cannot be established under the present moral, social, and political conditions of the world. The tragedy, he goes on to suggest, is that in no period of modern history was civilization in more need of permanent peace, and hence of a world state, and that in no period of modern history were the moral, social, and political conditions of the world less favorable to the establishment of a world state. During the 1950s, Morgenthau acknowledged the novelty of nuclear weapons, but he, still claimed, he, he was still clinging to the conventional solutions of massive American armament and the maintenance of a balance of power between the US and the Soviet Union. Yet, lurking behind these prescriptions was a growing suspicion on his part that conventional responses would not be enough. For instance, while he acknowledges that nuclear deterrence could be a force for peace, however precarious, he worries, I think appropriately, that the psychology of deterrence is dangerously complex 
and vulnerable to disastrous miscalculations. Similarly, while he urges the United States to prepare for and to be willing to fight a limited nuclear war, he worries that the success of such a war rests on leaders with an almost superhuman capacity to determine just the right atomic dosage required to avoid defeat without provoking all-out atomic retaliation. And so only by the end of the decade do these doubts develop into a complete and unwavering conception of the novelty of the nuclear threat. He concludes, the rational relationship between the means of violence and the ends of foreign policy has been destroyed by the availability of nuclear power as a, as a means to achieve those ends. For the possibility of universal destruction obliterates the means and relationship itself by threatening the nations and their ends with total destruction. No such radical qualitative transformation of the structure of international relations has ever occurred in history. Nuclear weapons had not only changed the practice of warfare, but had initiated an unprecedented transformation of international politics. Now, for me at least, it's hardly surprising that Morgenthau took more than a decade to fully acknowledge the radical novelty of the nuclear threat. His work from the 1940s and 1950s had embraced a tragic worldview as a polemical weapon against the dangerous moral certainty of American liberal internationalism, an ideology which Morgenthau diagnosed as itself a secularized form of the apocalyptic narrative of redemption through destruction. And while this tragic turn pervades much of his work from the 1940s and 1950s, Morgenthau's clearest articulation, some of you already know, um, of the tragic worldview is in the final chapter of Scientific Man versus Power Politics, his sharp-tongued critique of American liberalism. Here he says he aims to recover a tragic sense of life that has been lost in the modern era. At the root of a tragic worldview, he claims, is the awareness of unresolvable discord, contradictions and conflicts, which are inherent in the nature of things and which human reason is powerless to solve. Against what he takes to be the dangerous apocalyptic teleology of America's crusading Wilsonian liberalism, with its tendency to cast war as the violent prerequisite for a millennial and democratic peace, Morgenthau offers a tragic and cyclical conception of time. The fortunes of states and men rise and decline in what he calls an everlasting and ever undecided struggle with no hope for a settled end to political conflict. For Morgenthau, the inescapability of our tragic situation is guaranteed by two static constants of human nature, the lust for power and the will to dominate. These drives condemn us to a world of unresolvable discord whose patterns are so regular that they can be treated as unchanging laws. The liberal hope for a final and culminating war for a permanent democratic peace is simply a dangerous fantasy wielded by those who, again to quote Morgenthau, would prefer to gloss over the discord, the gloss over and distort the tragic contradictions of human existence with the soothing logic of specious concord. Now, apart from its undeniable critical resources, the benefit of a tragic worldview with its cyclical conception of political time is that we can turn to the past for guidance, as the fundamental conflicts of our age will always have historical analogs. However, the problem with a tragic worldview is not only that it makes us suspicious of claims to radical novelty, but it also leaves us without any intellectual or normative tools to confront that novelty. And this is a problem which Morgenthau's University of Chicago colleague, Hannah Arendt, had already diagnosed with regard to 20th century totalitarianism. We have a tendency, she explained, to equate totalitarian government with some well-known evil of the past, um, such as aggression, tyranny, conspiracy. This is understandable, she suggests. If the evils of the present were also the evils of the past, then we can turn to the past for political wisdom. The problem, she suggests, 
is that the wisdom of the, and I'm quoting her, the wisdom of the past dies, so to speak, in our hands as soon as we try to apply it honestly to the central political experiences of our own time. Everything we know of totalitarianism demonstrates a horrible originality which no far-fetched historical parallels can alleviate." End quote. And this, I think, is also the dilemma that Morgenthau confronts when his tragic worldview collides with the radical novelty of nuclear weapons. Tragedy had been a valuable antidote for, to quote Morgenthau, a civilization that likes to see novelty in history where there is none, end quote. However, it is, was ill-suited for a world which seemed to perceive, again Morgenthau, to perceive but dimly the genuine novelty with which nuclear power confronts it. So in his remarkable essay, Death in a Nuclear Age, from 1961, Morgenthau adopts a new strategy that acknowledges this radical novelty. He turns away from tragedy and toward the apocalyptic imaginary. Harnessing the darkest fears of annihilation against the radical hope of renewal through nuclear destruction, he calls upon his readers to imagine the apocalypse in order to prevent it. And in so doing, he draws upon the imaginary, the imagery of the post-war apocalyptic imaginary at the same time as he deprives us of its redemptive hopes. Now, both the lyrical style of the essay and its existential preoccupations mark a definitive break from his previous writings. He takes aim at what he sees as a dangerous optimism toward the prospect of nuclear war, an optimism which, as we've seen, was reflected in the work of RAND strategist Herman Kahn, the American government's human effects report, and the rhetoric and images of the fallout shelter movement. For Morgenthau, this optimism is the product of a desperate delusion. Implicating both himself and his readers, he warns, and I'm quoting, in spite of what some of us know in our reason, we continue to think and act as though the possibility of nuclear death portended only a quantitative extension of the mass dest destruction of the past and not a qualitative transformation of the meaning of our existence. Now, Morgenthau's essay attempts to wrench readers out of this dangerous complacency by offering a bleak account of a nuclear apocalypse without worldly redemption or renewal. The prospect of nuclear annihilation, he claims, has radically altered man's understanding of himself within time by denying him any hope of immortality. Death, Morgenthau explains, is the great scandal in the experience of man. It negates everything, and I'm quoting him, that man experiences as specifically human in his existence. The consciousness of himself and of his world, the remembrance of things past and the anticipation of things to come, a creativeness in thought and action which aspires to and approximates the eternal, end quote. Man preserves his humanity by transcending death. Historically, He's done this in three ways. He has denied the reality of death through a faith in human immortality. He has sought mastery over death through suicide or heroic sacrifice. And he has conquered death by achieving worldly immortality through his deeds and works. The secular modern age, Morgenthau suggests, has deprived us of the first strategy of uh, faith in immortality while the looming possibility of nuclear death has made the other two strategies absurd. Many religious believers transcend death through a belief in the immortality of the person. They may assume, Morgenthau suggests, that the finiteness of man's biological existence is but apparent, and that his body will live on in another world. Alternatively, they may insist that our specifically human attributes will survive the worldly destruction of our bodies and be preserved in another realm whose shape we can but dimly grasp. Morgenthau argues that religious immortality is no longer available to us as an option in the secular age. 
And perhaps this is not something that we should lament, he suggests. If we still have the comfort of religious belief, we could await nuclear death with calm acceptance. Perhaps we could even muster some enthusiasm as we, quote, look forward to the day of the great slaughter as a day on which the preparatory and vain life of this world would come to an end for most of us and the true eternal life in another world begin, end quote. However, the doubt and skepticism that define the modern age for Morgenthau mean that this strategy is at best one that can be privately contemplated by the individual believer. It cannot form the basis of a collective and public attempt to grapple with the meaning of death in a nuclear era. Without a faith in immortality, modern secular man is left with two alternatives, both of which are rendered absurd in the face of nuclear annihilation. First, he can attempt to master death by choosing to end his life through suicide or sacrifice. The latter gives him the best chance of being remembered for posterity. The hero who sacrifices himself for a cause gives his death and his life a larger meaning. However, this meaning depends on the existence of a culture or civilization that will live on to interpret and remember this courageous sacrifice. Drawing on examples from Greek mythology, Morgenthau reasons Patroclus dies to be avenged by Achilles. Hector dies to be mourned by Priam. Yet if Patroclus, Hector, and all those who could remember them were killed simultaneously, what would become of the meaning of their deaths? The mass death that would result from the deployment of the thermal nuclear weapon would deprive the individual hero of a surviving culture that could understand and honor his sacrifice. Even if some manage to survive a nuclear war, individual deaths will lose any historic significance. There is meaning in Leonidas falling at Thermopylae, in Socrates drinking the cup of hemlock, in Jesus nailed to the cross. There can be no meaning in the slaughter of the innocent, the murder of six million Jews, the prospective nuclear destruction of, say, 50 million Americans and an equal number of Russians, there is then a radical difference in meaning between a man risking death by an act of will and 50 million people simultaneously reduced by somebody switching a key thousands of miles away to radioactive ashes indistinguishable from the ashes of their houses, books, and animals. Like others writing in the post-war era, Morgenthau finds in the Na Nazi genocide the closest parallel to the prospect of nuclear annihilation. When death tolls are measured in the millions, lives and deaths have no meaning. The sheer violence, the sheer numbers, rob the, death, rob the dead of the possibility of worldly immortality through heroic sacrifice. What is remembered, if there is anyone left to remember, says Morgenthau, is the quantity of the killed. 6 million, 20 million, 50 million, not the quality of one man's death as over and against another's. Thus the heroic individual is both physically obliterated by being reduced to radioactive ashes and historically annihilated by being denied the hope of posterity. The second way in which modern secular man transcends death is by leaving behind the works of his will and his hands as evidence of his existence. He lives on through his children. He creates monuments, leaving behind, quoting Morgenthau, an inheritance of visible things, not to be consumed, but to be preserved as tangible mementos of past generations. Roma Eterna, the Reich of a thousand years are, as Morgenthau states, are but the most ambitious attempts to perpetuate man and his deeds. The tree he has planted, the house he has built, have been given a life likely to last longer than his own." End quote. Perhaps most importantly, man produces works of the imagination, books, poetry, art, which are lasting testaments to a distinctly human capacity for creativity. When he creates, Man participates in, quote, an unbroken chain emerging from the past and reaching into the future, which is made of the same stuff his mind is made of, 
and hence is capable of participating in and perpetuating his mind's creation, end quote. Nuclear war would eliminate both the physical products of man's creativity and the culture and civilization that guarantee his worldly immortality. Survivors would be reduced to the status of barbarians, deprived of the physical and imaginative artifacts through which the living honor and remember the dead. And here Mornithau's essay takes its most decisive turn as it rhetorically performs the apocalyptic annihilation whose enormity his contemporaries have systematically failed to grasp. Nuclear destruction is mass destruction, both of persons and of things. It signifies the simultaneous destruction of tens of millions of people, of whole families, generations, and societies, of all things they have inherited and created. It signifies total destruction of whole societies by killing their members, destroying their visible achievements, and therefore reducing the survivors to barbarism. Thus, nuclear destruction destroys the meaning of death by depriving it of its individuality. It destroys the meaning of immortality by making both society and history impossible. It destroys the meaning of life by throwing life back upon itself. Now here, Morgenthau calls forth all the markers of civilization and posterity, families, generations, visible achievements, only to rhetorically annihilate them. Here I think there's a parallel with, for instance, Hobbes' description of the state of nature. Um, in so doing, he offers the reader an apocalypse in which the suffering and death of millions are deprived of meaning. Those who survive are not an elect chosen to preside over a new world, but a shattered remnant reduced to barbarism. Against the looming prospect of a nuclear apocalypse, Morgenthau stages a rhetorical apocalypse to shake his readers of their thoughtless optimism. In short, he fights apocalypse with apocalypse. He calls upon his readers to imagine nuclear annihilation in order to prevent it. Now, such prevention could be achieved in the long term only with an appropriate institutional solution. And since the 1940s, Morgenthau had recognized that the only reliable safeguard against total annihilation was a world state with a monopoly on nuclear violence. I'm quoting him now. It is only when nations have surrendered the means of destruction which modern technology has put in their hands, it's only when nations have surrendered those to a higher authority, when they have given up their sovereignty, that international peace can be made as secure as domestic peace. Quote. Yet such a state was not possible in the absence of a world society, he told us. The unity of mankind would have to precede the creation of a world state. In a world marked by crusading Cold War ideologies, this kind of unity seemed like a dim and futile hope. By the 1960s, however, Morgenthau had begun to recognize in the prospect of nuclear annihilation not just a novel threat, but a novel possibility. It presents us with nothing less than an opportunity to effect a fundamental transformation of humanity. An inchoate awareness, he suggests, of the unity of mankind, long submerged by the crusading ideologies of the Cold War, has been sharpened by a common fear of nuclear death. Our longing to give some political and institutional form to this unity has been greatly strengthened in the nuclear age by the desire, he suggests, innate in all men for self-preservation. This desire, Morgenthau claims, could now be harnessed in a way that had been previously been impossible to abolish, quote, international relations itself through the merger of all national sovereignties into one world state, which would have a monopoly of the most destructive instruments of violence." End quote. However, Morgenthau's essay on nuclear death betrays some doubt about whether we can rely on this innate desire to emerge on its own as a political force. Clinging to the hope of secular immortality, we fail to grasp the enormity of the nuclear threat. In response, I suggest, Morgenthau strips his readers 
of the comforts of, new, of secular immortality and leaves them with a terrifying account of nuclear annihilation that facilitates the cultivation of a salutary fear. He envisions a radical transformation of human nature. No longer would humans be driven by our pursuit of power or our will to dominate. In the shadow of nuclear apocalypse, self-preservation would become our guiding motivation and the basis for a project of permanent peace. Thus prepared, he hoped we might be willing to accept our common humanity and to contemplate the possibility of a world state capable of preventing nuclear annihilation. Now we can discuss together whether Morgenthau gives us reason to be optimistic about this possibility. For me, this is where the irony of his position becomes clear. In attempting to combat dangerously hopeful scenarios of nuclear apocalypse, Morgenthau succumbs to the millennial fantasy of a world state able to guarantee permanent peace. Yet Morgenthau could never clearly specify what such a world state would look like. Its contours remain <laughs> fundamentally unimaginable. He is willing to accept with Hobbes Quote, that society has no substitute for the power of the Leviathan, whose very presence towering above contending groups keeps their conflicts within peaceful bounds, end quote. However, he cannot bring himself to accept the possibility of a global equivalent to the Habesian sovereign, a universal tyranny capable of terrorizing an unwilling humanity into perpetual peace. Morgenthau declares that such a world state would be a totalitarian monster resting on feet of clay, the very thought of which startles the imagination. Throughout the 1960s, he toys with various alternatives, all of which fall short of a world state with a monopoly on violence. He considers the possibility of an American-led free association of liberal democratic states that would exercise supranational control over nuclear weapons. He considers a concerted effort by the United Nations to point the world in the direction of replacing national sovereignty with supranational decisions and institutions. And he considers a system of joint Soviet and American sovereignty over the world. Now all of these solutions fall short of the new Leviathan that he thinks would be required to guarantee permanent peace and human survival in a nuclear world. Morgenthau's inability to imagine the contours of the world state strikes some of his critics, and I include William Schwerman here, strikes some of his critics as an intellectual failing, a fundamental theoretical incoherence, or an unwillingness to fully abandon a narrow realism that was dangerously unsuited to a nuclear world. I might suggest instead that it is the vestiges of a tragic realism with its insistence that projects of permanent peace are the most dangerous forms of political escapism that prevents him from surrendering completely to the millennial fantasy of a world without conflict. What I think is clear, however, is that his engagement with the nuclear threat and the apocalyptic imaginary represent a distinct turn away from the tragic realism of his earlier writings and toward the more ambitious and perhaps more utopian project of calling on us to imagine the apocalypse in order to prevent it. So thank you.